right, let's just stop pretending that I have any sort of consistency, theme, anything you can come to expect on this channel, other than just what I've been thinking about too much and spend too much time on the internet researching. And if y'all haven't watched the award-winning series Rush Talk, I mean, you're missing out. Last year, TikTok for you pages across the world were inundated with OOTDs, what's in my rush bag, and elaborate dances outside multi-million dollar mansions. And the trend has now become so popular, there's rumors that HBO Max and Vice are filming a documentary on the topic. But don't worry guys, they promised it would be tasteful. And if you're not from the US, or you're just not familiar with Greek life, I mean, it is just like a whole other world, a whole other like level when you get to the University of Alabama. Greek life at UA is the largest sect of student life, making up about a third of the student population. And each year, thousands of young hopefuls move into campus early for weeks of small talk, ranking their preferences, and at times getting brutally rejected by swarms of pretty women. Alabama's Panhellenic Association, or PHA, makes up 19 out of their 24 social sororities on campus. And according to last year's statistics, 2,500 women signed up to rush and just about 2,300 ended up accepting a bid. And since Alabama student life makes up about a third of the student population, they've at this point produced some pretty notable alumni. We of course have Hannah Brown from Bachelor Nation, who was in Alpha Chi Omega. And then we have Bernie Madoff, who was in Sigma Alpha Mu briefly before transferring and did nothing notable after that. And of course, it's no wonder why Bama Rush went viral the way it did. I mean, to a lot of us, it feels like either a reality show or an NFL draft pick even, except with really rich teenagers. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say that PNM spent thousands of dollars preparing for these couple of weeks. And while I've seen people on TikTok point out some of the toxic experiences either they've had personally or that exist in the Greek life system generally or at the University of Alabama. I don't know if people realize just how deep this all goes. Like what if I told you that even beyond all of these organizations, there existed a secret society within these organizations that had worked for over a hundred years at this point to control basically every sect of Alabama student life. And it's just not so loosely connected to a bunch of reconstruction era racists. And it goes further than that. Many have gone on to represent Alabama at the state level and at the national level. I'm talking about Alabama's chapter of Theta Nu Epsilon, better known by Alabama students as the machine. <laughs> okay, okay. So, while I was researching this video, at times I often felt like I was Charlie from It's Always Sunny, like doing that meme. And so I thought, oh, wouldn't it be so funny, haha, -ha, if I made a board like that? <laughs> and um, as you can see, I had some problems with my printer. So I first tried printing in color and everything sort of came out this like putrid yellow shade, as you can especially see from this crimson white logo, which is not particularly crimson, I would say. Um, and so I was like, okay, clearly my printer can't handle color. I will just print in black and white. It's not that big of a deal. But then <laughs> everything I printed in black and white came out this sort of um, rejected season of Ghost Adventures tinged green. Clearly the machine has hacked into my printer and they also hacked into my filming equipment because this is my second time filming this video. And as y'all of course can see, I'm using a wand from an undisclosed, unnamed magical franchise as my pointer. You know, I had a vision and that vision did not materialize and we're all just gonna have to live with the consequences of it, all right? So secret societies, turns out not that uncommon in colleges anyways. I mean, sororities and fraternities in a general sense started out as just like secret clubs for rich people that they could just hang out in. And extra secret societies are just like an elevated version of that. But I remember one of my friends went to UVA and I was visiting her and I kept seeing these giant like Zs everywhere and these other signs. And so I asked her what that was all about and she's like, oh yeah, that's just like our university's secret society. And it turns out the Z society is a very real thing. They were created in the 1800s to skim the cream of UVA society and were often members who had made either academic or financial uh, contributions to the university. And they also pull a significant weight in UVA politics, it seems. But my friend did tell me that when a Z society member dies, the bell tower on their campus rings and everybody just knows that that's what that's about. My college just had people um, who fought each other with Nerf guns at night, so. Theta Nu Epsilon is a similar secret society that was originally started at Wesleyan University. And the group historically would select notable men on campus. They did eventually introduce women as well. And it's not particularly clear what these groups would do in their spare time other than have secret handshakes and secret special time with Du Bois. Maybe it's just because I was in a sorority, but I feel like half of the sort of self-importance comes from making up a bunch of secrets for yourself and being like, ooh, no one knows our secrets. 
were so cool. And if we want to get technical, Theta Nu Epsilon also had a split off group called the Skulls. And technically speaking, the Skulls are a separate group from Theta Nu Epsilon. But in reality, it's just like uh, one group of bros got tired of hanging out with the other group of bros, but they're still like the same secret group of bros, you know, like it's not that big of a group. So just for the sake of consistency, Theta Nu Epsilon, Skulls, Skull and Bones, all generally referring to the same thing. The Skull chapter at Yale is actually pretty infamous because it's tied to a lot of Illuminati world order conspiracy theories because as you can imagine it's had a lot of Yale elites who went on to be US presidents involved in it and unlike the chapter that would later form at Alabama it doesn't seem like the Yale group made as much of an effort to be secret so we actually know quite a number of alums like there was President Howard Taft and the two Bushes not Jeb though Jeb didn't go to Yale please clap and actually, the U.S. 2004 presidential election was made up of two alums because John Kerry, the Democratic candidate, was also a rumored alumni. But Alabama, so it's believed that the Alpha Rho chapter of Theta Nu Epsilon formed in 1888. And it's also rumored that the school started in 1909. But again, same group of secret boys. And both versions of these group were actually publicly recognized by the university for several years before they mysteriously disappeared in 1922, never to be seen again. Or did they? No. No, they didn't. Among the former founders of this group was former Senate Majority Leader Jay Lister Hill. Jay Lister Hill would actually later go on to be the Senate Majority Leader for the US Congress and was considered to be a moderate to progressive populist Democrat, which naturally means that he publicly opposed Brown versus Board of Education and voted twice against the Civil Rights Act. He also formed the SGA, and while he was at it, he was the first president of the SGA. And it was all downhill from Mr. Lister because you see, in the last 100 years, it's rumored that maybe 10 of the SGA presidents were not machine candidates. Because what Theta Nu Epsilon does is it's made up of, at this time it's just fraternities, it'll go on to be fraternities and sororities. There's a collection of fraternities and sororities and each one will select a machine representative. Those machine representatives will get together in a basement and decide which one of their sorority and fraternity members they want to be SGA Senate, SGA president, homecoming queen, all of that stuff. And then they'll go back to their sororities and fraternities and be like, hey, vote for these people. If you don't vote for these people, you'll get infractions. And if you do vote for these people, you'll get free beer and stuff, allegedly. We'll get into it. And of course, I can't speak for how it was at that particular time, but even though the Greek life system is far from the majority of campus life, this is a pretty effective system when you have a couple thousand consistent people voting in SGA elections, because infamously, no one votes in SGA elections besides people who are like interested in running and are voting for their friends. So Jay Lister Hill would be the one to officially start this trend. But I don't want all of these other people to feel safe up here because Jay Lister Hill was not the only racist among the original founders. For example, we also have Ferris Coleman Jr. Ferris Coleman Jr. was listed as Theta Nu Epsilon president in 1912 in one of the few public documents we actually have on the organization. Ferris was also captain of the Alabama football team and ran the university yearbook. Now, Ferris unfortunately did not have as much time to make a mark on Alabama politics because he died briefly after that in 1919. But his father, who I could not find a picture of, so we'll just visualize him, but his father, Ferris Coleman Sr., actually went to the University of Alabama right around the time that the Theta Nu Epsilon was rumored to be beginning. And so while Baby Ferris was going to school, Big Ferris was on the board of trustees for the University of Alabama and was also the court reporter for the Alabama Supreme Court. And then his father, Ferris Coleman Jr.'s grandfather, Augustus Coleman, was just a good old fashioned successionist trader. Augustus Coleman did not attend the University of Alabama. He actually went to Yale, interestingly, right around the time that the Yale chapter at Theta Nu Epsilon was rumored to be started. But then that little thing called the Civil War happened. And so he was part of the Alabama Succession Committee and he personally funded his own little infantry before returning to the United States because, you know, he lost, spoiler alert. But that did not slow him down. He then became a judge and went into a career in politics and he introduced what was called the Coleman Bill. The Coleman Bill introduced mass incarceration in the state as the not so subtle way to replace slavery now that they couldn't really use that to subjugate people of color in the country. And I wanted to point out this lineage because even though they are not machine alums specifically, 
I don't find their careers in politics or their political ideologies to be particularly unique, at least to the early group. And even to this day, major figures in Alabama politics have allegedly come from the machine. Some supposed members include Congressman Jack Edwards, Walter Flowers, Albert Raines, and William Dickinson. Don Siegelman, a former Alabama governor, was SGA president and rumored to be a machine member. Don Siegelman for Lieutenant Governor a proven record of fighting crime. And he was later convicted on some federal felony corruption charges. Bill Blount, another rumored machine member, was head of the Alabama Democratic Party, but he also pled guilty to just a little bit of bribery and conspiracy in exchange for testimony against the former Birmingham mayor, Larry Langford. And those that don't become politicians often become prominent figures in their communities, businessmen, attorneys. Like Tommy Wells was briefly the former president of the American Bar Association, which has a whole other unique racist history, which we don't have time to get into. Of course, because the group is registered and technically a secret, we don't know for sure if any of these people were machine members. But the machine for many years, it seems, has sort of treated the SGA as a training ground. People who are interested in politics in these fraternities can use this opportunity, one, because it looks good on their resume, two, to get experience and go into actual Alabama politics or national politics. And control of the SGA is also important to the machine because the machine represents fraternities and sororities, and so they can effectively make sure that the SGA doesn't pass any sort of ordinances or restrictions on Greek life that would force them to change in any meaningful way. So by the 1920s, the Crimson White had become aware of the machine's overwhelming control on Alabama politics and dubbed them the political machine. And that is where the phrase machine comes from and is the name that has really stuck with the group ever since. So. So from the time that the schools formed the SGA, they would actually maintain control of the SGA presidency up until 1936 when they would be defeated for the first time. If he was blocking the mic, I'm sorry. Up until 1936 when they would be defeated for the first time by independent Carl Elliott. Now Carl Elliott would also later go on to be a racist US representative and publicly oppose Brown versus Board of Education as well. So, you know. But really, Carl's just a blip because the machine would go on to maintain control again up until 1963 and 1964, which are believed to be the only two years in a row where the machine did not have the SGA presidency. Notably, this was around the same time that Alabama governor George Wallace would block the entrance to the university's auditorium to prevent two black students, Vivian Malone and James Hood, from enrolling. This was a pretty pathetic attempt to make good on his campaign promise, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And so the first anti-machine group would form in the late 1960s called the Coalition, an equally mysterious name because let's face it, this is all about branding. This group was also led by several figures who would go on to have pretty prominent political careers, but the coalition was a collection of dormitories, international students, Afro-American organizations, and sororities. And in their brief run, they were able to elect several non-machine candidates, not to the presidency, but to the SGA Senate. And it was through that they were able to get funding for the Afro-American Association. The group would sort of fall apart going into the 1970s. But the 1970s was a pretty major time for social and political upheaval, both in Alabama and of course nationally. The Alabama football team was desegregated and we had our first black cheerleader introduced in 1974. During this time, we also saw the founding of more historically black fraternities and sororities on campus, but also just growing membership within these groups. And so in 1976, we had the first black SGA president, Leo Thomas. Leo Thomas ran as an anti-machine candidate and was a member of a historically black fraternity. He was elected in part because of another coalition of white sororities and African-American interest groups. And his victory was met with several threats on Cleo's life which escalated to 15 men in white sheets, burning across, throwing bottles, and chanting, quote, revolutionary tunes. And while this isn't confirmed, it's believed that this group was the machine or associated with the machine. And so to regain control of campus politics, the machine opened its membership to white sororities. In 1983, newly elected independent SGA president John Bolas would discover that his phone was tapped at his home and it may have been tapped for the entire run of his campaign. He had only just discovered it right after he won. And when he traced it, <clears throat> the wiring ran along a fence about a hundred yards, um, maybe not quite that much, down to an alley. Uh, and at the end was was a jack that would, would plug into a tape recorder. There was a federal investigation into this incident, but the case was sealed and we don't know any more information about the two men who confessed to this crime. A later leak of what we believe is the machine constitution would reference this incident and say that it was really embarrassing and that it should never be repeated again. Don't you hate when you get caught spying on people? In 1986, another independent SGA candidate, John Bolas, would walk into his office and discover that two men 
from fraternities had broken into his office. These were, again, believed to be machine members, but it just so happened that the Crimson White, the university newspaper, was right down the hall from his office. So he walks in, sees two men late at night, and just goes boop, 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 boop. Hey, Crimson White, y'all want to hear about this? And they came down to the office, and they brought a camera, and they started asking him questions, and they took his picture, and he commences to telling all what they were trying to do and why they were trying to do it. It was unbelievable that it happened the way that it did. And it seems to be actually a pretty major push in his campaign because he was able to win the presidency that year. But this was not the only concerning incident that he experienced. According to John, he received several threats against his life. His wife would often receive threatening phone calls threatening to kill or assault her. His tires were slashed at his home several times. And one of his campaign members claimed that they were driven off a road by an unnamed figure. Also, in 1986, another cross would be burned, this time in front of the historically black sorority house Alpha Kappa Alpha. No charges were filed in this case, but it's again believed to be linked to the machine. The machine was really in their mafia era at this time. In 1989, the machine would nominate their first woman candidate for SGA president. In Joey Vaselli, an independent would run directly against her. And Vaselli's father happened to run a very popular pizza restaurant in town called Bamos Bino's Pizza. Bad luck. When it's got to be good and fast, call Bama Bino. And now, back to the game. Hey! I don't have a win. <laughs> and immediately after Joey started running, sororities and fraternities stopped placing orders at Bama Bino's. According to his father, he was no longer asked to cater at events for the university that he was previously always asked to, and he would basically get no sales on game day, which were historically pretty important days for a pizza restaurant in a college town. And so even though in years prior, Bama Bino's was bringing in a million dollars in revenue, within two years of Joey Vaselli trying to run for SJ president, he didn't even win. Within two years, Bama Bino's would be closed. A machine pamphlet that was believed to be distributed at this time, notably said, one standard we base our membership on is the future usefulness of newcomers to our union and its members. We are proud of our history at the university. Theta Nu Epsilon has elected SGA president 68 times in the 75 years of the SGA's existence. This is because the SGA is ours. Our brethren formed it in 1914. Also in 1989, there would be a pretty major upset in the university's homecoming election. As I mentioned previously, the machine ordinarily also elects a homecoming candidate. But when people noticed that the two homecoming queen nominations were only white women, there was actually a last minute write-in campaign to elect a black woman, Kimberly Ashley, who went on to win the campaign, but she was booed at her crowning ceremony. And the machine was so upset about this, they introduced a bill in the Senate, which would essentially add Add an electoral college to homecoming decisions where the Greek life would get to choose the homecoming queen. But activists in the Crimson White were able to defeat this bill by marketing it as the Negro Queen Exclusion Act. Yeah, doesn't sound great when you put it that way. However, the machine has still managed to have a stronghold on homecoming elections as well. And even in the past couple of years has sparked rumors of election fraud. More on that later. Also too many times to count and it didn't feel appropriate to put on this board. It feels like there was at least an annual protest outrage scandal because a fraternity or sorority would be caught doing blackface, being publicly racist either at their socials or at their private parties. And of course, a major source of a lot of these scandals was the Alabama chapter of Kappa Alpha. Kappa Alpha hosted these antebellum parties, which you may recognize as the reason we don't have Chris Harrison on The Bachelor anymore. You know, I saw a picture of her at a sorority party five years ago and that's it, like, boom, like, okay, well, this, this girl is in this book now, and she's now in this group. And I'm like, really? Okay, well, there well, goes- the picture was from 2018 at an Old South antebellum party. So if I went to that party, what would I represent I, at that party? Kappa Alpha is historically known for being pretty celebratory of some Civil War figures, notably not those who represented the North. Robert E. Lee being a spiritual founding father, I, I guess having him in the house, uh, is, is, is what we feel um, sets us apart from, from other fraternities and, uh, and, and what we were founded on and what we believe in. And, and I've run a fair and honest campaign, and I'm a fair and honest person, but because KA is after my name or rumored machine candidate, I'm a, I'm a bad person, and I don't know where that, I don't know where that comes from. And do you know who founded the Kappa Alpha chapter at Alabama? Ferris Coleman Jr. It's all connected, folks. 
It's all connected. In 1991, the Crimson White would report that the machine had stolen 4,000 copies of their paper because it was the day before the election and the Crimson White was scheduled to release an expose on the group. But in 1992, Esquire would release what I believe is probably the most hard-hitting piece of journalism on the group, calling it the most powerful fraternity in America. And I like to imagine the release of this article was kind of like when Tati released the Bye Sister video, like everyone was just kind of I don't know, I wasn't there. But certainly ripple effects, public shockwaves for years to come. And I do recommend you read this video. I'll have it linked in the description as well as some other sources I used. But a few notable things. First, one of the people they interview who is alleged to be a machine member, his name is Chad. And I just think that's wonderful storytelling. They also allege that the then current, for now former US Senator for Alabama, Richard Shelby is a member of the machine. And they also state that in 1992, the machine was rumored to have a budget of $300,000. Because another thing I haven't mentioned is the machine collects dues from each fraternity and sorority who is a member. And what's interesting about that is that, of course, the machine isn't registered with the university, it's a secret group. But ordinarily, sororities and fraternities have to keep a budget of what's going in and out of their organization. But when there's like thousands of people in Greek life, it's like thousands of dollars being circulated and budgeting is just left up to a bunch of drunk college students. So we truly have no idea how much money is going into the machine, especially today. The article also included this quote from former SGA president Trey Boston. There was never any kind of phone call. I was never told they were going to endorse me. I was never personally told. There just came to be an understanding that they were going to endorse me. But if you look at the list of men, and now a woman, who've been endorsed by the machine and elected SGA president at the University of Alabama, you see U.S. senators, you see congressmen, you see doctors, you see lawyers, you see businessmen. You see people that, when I consider that my name is going to be thrown on the bottom of that list, it's like, what am I doing there? I'm related, but Trey Boston was also a member of Alabama's chapter of Sigma Alpha Epsilon, or SAE for short. And I came across this article from the New York Times in 1992 that the SAE chapter at Alabama was suspended for four years in 1992 after being caught trafficking cocaine in 1988. Mr. Boston said the suspension was a quote, slap in the face. Yeah, we also had SAE at my university and they were also suspended, but I think they were just suspended for giving alcohol to high school students and stealing the other chapter's wooden letters. And I definitely don't wish that they did worse things, but it's certainly less exciting. But shortly after this article was released, these rising tensions would all come to a head when a non-machine candidate for SGA president and soon to be daughter of Alabama governor, Minda Riley, would run directly against her chapter Find You and the Machine's Wishes for SGA president. According to Riley, a cross was burned outside her home and she was assaulted in her home by a masked assailant with a knife. And she was so disturbed by these events that she's never returned to Alabama since. There was another federal investigation into this incident and the university shut down the SGA for several years. So y'all may recognize the FIMU White House. I realize that on this board it is green, but I assure you in real life it is in fact white. And this is not the same house that existed in the 1990s. I believe this was recently renovated. But before this incident, there were 12 houses on what's known as Greek Row, six sororities and six fraternities. And Greek Row is really considered to be the prime real estate because let's say you're an incoming student, like going on a tour, those are the houses that you're going to see the most. But after this incident happened, Fine you was moved to Greek Row. So now there are seven sororities and six fraternities. And so it seems like <laughs> The machine let FIMU have this prime real estate because they were like, mm, sorry, we assaulted one of your members here, have this big house. And another sad thing, I mean, these are all sad things, but Minda's older brother, Bob, was actually SGA president and believed to be a machine candidate in the 1980s. And he said that he had no doubt that the machine was behind her assault, which if that's the case, Bob, were these not your people just like, Two years ago, I have some follow-up questions for you. I don't know, I just get the feeling that that next Thanksgiving was very awkward. In 1999, another black candidate for SGA president, Fabian Singa, would come forward and describe some of the racial discrimination and harassment he'd experienced. And he again alleged that this was coming from the machine and was part of a larger pattern of discrimination and animus in the Greek system. In both 2000 and 2001, a Alabama student, Melody Twiley, attempted to be the first black woman accepted into a traditionally white sorority. Yep, even in the 21st century, Alabama's sororities and fraternities were still racially segregated. And reports claim that 
a combination of alumni influence and the machine were behind Melody being denied a bid both times. And this would actually make pretty big headlines at the time. The U.S. Chair for Commission on Civil Rights said that she was sympathetic to Melody because there were so many other larger incidents of discrimination happening nationally, no formal action could really be taken. But in 2003, the first black woman would be accepted into Gamma Phi Beta. However, a Gamma Phi Beta member would come forward and say that Carla Ferguson's bid to Gamma Phi Beta was made in exchange for Gamma Phi Beta getting a seat on the machine. Because not every social sorority and fraternity are really seen equally, even within the system, especially not in the early 2000s. There was still very much a hierarchy where the sort of cooler, if you will, more prominent sororities and fraternities were the ones making decisions for the machine and ultimately for the entire Greek system. And so Stephanie McGee alleged that Gamma Phi Beta accepted Carla in exchange for some influence in the machine. And according to Stephanie, Gamma Phi Beta did not follow the traditional voting procedures for recruitment that year, and Carla's bid was entirely decided by the executive board of Gamma Phi Beta. Interim UA Vice President of Student Affairs, Kathleen Kramer responded to these allegations and said that she was disappointed that Stephanie's allegations had been printed. She, for one, believed that Gamma Phi Beta sincerely wanted Carla and was proud to have her as a member. I mean, I think two things can be true at once, especially in this situation. But she said that she did not believe that the sorority used illegal methods to ensure Carla's bid. She said, quote, I don't think that's possible for most chapters for a select group to select the pledges. So I really must question the credibility of the students' allegations. And to that I say, Kathleen, that is not in any sense the craziest allegation in that story. Like, let's just skip over the whole bargaining chip in exchange for a secret society seat thing. If you have been in a sorority or a fraternity, y'all know sometimes the exec board just does what they want to do. That is not the most implausible part of that story. But regardless, this all sucks for Carla because either it is true and she may feel like her bid is less valuable or everyone effectively thinks that it's true and treats her that way. I mean, that just does not seem like an ideal way to start your relationship with your sorority. Also in 2003, Alabama would first introduce internet voting for their SGA elections. Although these results would later have to be invalidated because there were um, some not so minor and substantial evidence of election fraud. In 2004, Emmeline Aviki, a member of Chi Omega at Alabama, would detail her experience with the machine when she refused to vote in line with them. And according to her, her entire pledge class was told to ice her out not to communicate with her. And this included some of her family friends who she had grown up with since childhood. And according to her, the emotional and psychological toll of all of this isolation led to her transferring to Duke University where she would go on to serve as class president. So for whatever reason, the next 10 years on the machine are pretty quiet. Not to say that there weren't other things happening, but they're much more minor compared to what we were talking about previously. But in 2013, we get some pretty major scandals, both related to the machine and to Greek life. First off, in 2013, emails surfaced from alleged machine fraternities and sororities directing members of these fraternities and sororities to vote for specific candidates in a local election in exchange for limo rides and free beer. Now, these two candidates were not random. They were former UA alums, and one of them was a former SGA president. According to voting records, more than 60% of the voters in that election were women who had registered in the last week of registration. Now, people have defended this, including those two people, Lee and Kirby, who ended up winning their campaigns, because in theory, there is nothing wrong with encouraging university students to participate in their local community. They're members of that local community. And yes, I have no problem <laughs> against encouraging voter registration and participation for anybody. Where it gets less defensible is where you're directing them to vote for specific people, because that is directly contrary to the idea of free thought and free voter participation. But also, when you're bribing them with alcohol, a pretty valuable currency when it comes to college students, it's just, it's not encouraging voting at that point. And in fact, one woman described seeing a sorority girl walk into the voting booth, shaking, walk out, and then be redirected back in with her two sorority sisters. And so when Case and Kirby and Lee Garrison won their campaign, their opponents refused to concede. And this actually did result in a lawsuit. Anderson argued that many of the students did not meet residency requirements or were intimidated or bribed to vote. We've had uh, emails that 
that we gave to the court today that show that concert tickets were given to people that proved that they voted in the election. Case and Kirby's attorney, Andrew Campbell, objected to all of Anderson's claims, saying they were broad allegations and hearsay. Now, this lawsuit was eventually tossed out because while they did discover that there were some people who were not eligible to vote, did not vote properly, it wasn't enough to invalidate the election entirely. Also in 2013, the university would direct sororities and fraternities to immediately end racial discrimination in their recruitment process. While we will not tell any group who they must pledge, the University of Alabama will not tolerate discrimination of any kind. The chapter members are ready to move forward. The University of Alabama will support them in every way possible. We will work extremely hard to remove any barriers that they perceive. And the administration actually acknowledged that the Greek system was racially segregated. So to combat this, each sorority would have to immediately enter what's called a competitive open bid process, or COB. Now, unlike the rush that we see on TikTok, COB is a lot more informal. Sororities will go out and interview a handful of girls and maybe have like a couple, we call them like sister dates. And then if they like them, they'll invite them and they'll just be a part of that pledge class who came in with the traditional rush. And so the hope was that the sororities would use the COB process to target, no, target sounds aggressive, to seek out uh, more people of color to join their organizations. And also at this time, the uh, aforementioned racist alumni were banned from participating in their Greek organizations as well. Now, the reason all of this happened, this was actually in response to allegations which had been printed in the Crimson White, where two black women had again been denied bids to traditionally white sororities. This included a woman named Kennedy Cobb, who not only apparently had a very impressive resume and credentials, but was also the granddaughter of a prominent Alabama judge who was a sitting member on the University Board of Trustees. So it seemed that even if you had everything a sorority would want, even nepotism, it was not enough to overcome just the blatant racism that was going on in the recruitment process. And this really would have all been buried if it hadn't been for some of these former sorority sisters coming out and speaking about this publicly. I just heard that there was a black girl coming through and that she was wonderful and fabulous and she had a resume that would embarrass any of us. But when it was time to determine whether to let the girl join, God says sorority leaders decided a vote was not necessary. And of course, I say, are we not going to talk about the black girl? According yeah. to Gotts, the only reason the leaders gave for eliminating the girl was a, quote, technicality on her letter of recommendation. If she had been white, do you think she would have? Yeah, I do. And that's the problem. No doubt in your mind. Really, no. And while this is, of course, a great step in the right direction. It's important to note that sororities at Alabama are still overwhelmingly white and disproportionate to the overall student population at Alabama. And this really isn't something that you can just attribute to lack of interest either. I mean, people of color have plenty of reason, plenty of real history to be skeptical in these spaces. I mean, these spaces are intimidating to me. I can only imagine what it's like as a woman of color walking into one of these houses. And if you want to compare sororities to fraternities, the stats are even worse. In 2018, black men only made up 0.8% of traditionally white fraternities, despite making up 10% of the overall student population. Because it's not fraternities that are going viral on TikTok. It's not fraternities that are getting widespread media attention. University of Alabama Student Government Association is causing controversy again after not passing a resolution to encourage racial integration in the Greek system. The resolution was not an affirmative action bill, but still did not pass in the Senate vote. So this was a bill that was introduced in the Senate just a few months after the sorority desegregation order was in place. And it was written by, among others, this woman, Katie Smith, who was formerly a machine member in a sorority, but I believe had left at this point. And from what I can see, the bill really seemed like it was meant to be just like a slam dunk. Hey, the SGA doesn't think it's cool to be racist. Like it wasn't setting a quota or a goal or anything. It was just a bill that said, hey, the Greeks system has been racist and we don't want to do that anymore. 
But apparently, as soon as Katie introduced the bill, she was met with a lot of hostile questions. And so the bill was killed. But then it seems that this news story picked up a lot more than the SGA Senate anticipated. And of course, it looks really bad when the SGA Senate is like, mm, desegregation, no thanks. Like, that's not a good look. So the bill was introduced this time by a machine candidate. And apparently the language of the bill was much softer. It had removed some of the language that addressed Greek life's past racism and was just like, Greek life is so great and they do so many good things and now we're gonna be not racist, aren't we so great? And from Katie's perspective, she seemed to get the sense that one, this bill was killed because it wasn't introduced by a machine member and the machine can't stand not being in control. Two, I don't think the Senate expected this to be picked up nationally, right? So they introduced it again um, to pass it very quickly with sort of watered down language so that they could um, not be accused of racism quite so directly anymore. And so Bloom, the SGA president, who of course was believed to be a machine candidate, said, I believe the resolution passed tonight is a great solution. My administration and I are dedicated to seeing and encouraging results in the integration of both fraternities and sororities. And I believe the resolution passed tonight, in addition to the diversity caucus, which will be introduced soon, are incredible first steps. And I also saw a letter that was written by Katie Smith's mother to the university president at the time. And it's really heartbreaking. I'm including some screenshots up on the screen, but it's pretty long. So I'm going to also have it linked in the description if anybody wants to read it. Katie's mother talks about how Katie joined a sorority, how she was really excited, how she was elected as a machine candidate because she didn't really have any reason to suspect that that would be a problem. And, and then anytime she found herself disagreeing with the machine, well, she felt isolated and threatened. Her mother talks about the time that her sorority was asked to vote in that 2013 election. They talk about some of the hazing that was going on. I don't know if you've heard of bumping for like sorority socials. It's something I thankfully was not aware of until after I graduated college, like only within this past year. But I guess at some universities in Greek life, they'll put the new sorority girls in a line and then the new fraternity boys in a line at like their social events. And then the guys will just literally go up and bump them like physically. And it's kind of just an excuse for them to grope it's a bunch of sorority girls. Really gross, but apparently her sorority participated in that, which obviously is not something a, a mother wants to hear. And so Katie left her sorority and introduced this bill in the Senate. And like I said, had a pretty negative experience with it. And so her mother was just upset with all of this. So I don't really know the outcome of this letter if the university ever gave a formal response, but I thought it was worth mentioning. And something about this bill getting struck down, I mean, this has been the theme throughout the entire episode, but students at a university shouldn't feel like desegregating their university is within their control or something that they can just like vote on for SGA. You know, they, they should be passing resolutions on whether there's chocolate milk in the dining hall. You know what I mean? They shouldn't have to advocate for things that were policies in the 1960s, like bare minimum. The fact that SGA senators, Katie and other people as well, felt the need to even bring this resolution really does speak to like some much larger scale, like administrative failures to remedy this whole situation. Situation. Amber Scales, who in 2018 was president of Alpha Kappa Alpha and also ran for SGA president in 2018, said that while there had been improvements since 2013, there was still a long way to go. One of the things she mentioned was that the Greek Rush Guide, for example, in their illustrations often did not feature women of color, which of course can seem like a small thing, but it's another signal of the people that are expected to be in these spaces. And of course that doesn't even get into the high financial barrier to entry that still categorically excludes large sex of student life. And Amber said, there's usually a very comparative narrative when it comes to being black on campus. Don't be a Cardi B, be a Michelle. At the end of the day, they are both women of color and should express themselves any way they see fit. They've had different cultural experiences that have led them to be different people, and one should not be better because they are more palatable to white people. And so, according to Amber and others as well, one of the reasons why black women may still elect to join traditionally black sororities over traditionally white sororities is that these sororities are still judging these women's ability to assimilate to white Southern culture. But jumping back to the timeline, in 2015, Elliot Spillers became the second black SGA candidate and is likely the first non-machine candidate to win the presidency in over 30 years. But shortly after the election, the SGA Senate would actually try to block him from selecting his own chief of staff. And it actually got so ridiculous that the University of Alabama had to step in and be like, guys, let him pick his own chief of staff. But I mean, surprisingly, Elliot had a pretty optimistic outlook on the political influence of the machine at that time. The machine is, it's not as relevant as it used to be. Um, you have to understand that a lot of 
the machine's power now is starting to diminish because they're not evolving as a group. And a lot of the machine reps who are in the machine um, aren't even from in-state. A lot of them aren't from in-state. And so a lot of the, the politics and the history and traditions that the machine comes with, a lot of them aren't even accustomed to that. And so I think that because our canvas is evolving and the machine is not evolving, then it makes them a lot a lot less influential. However, they do still have some sway, especially with the younger groups. That's freshmen and sophomores across campus. In 2017, the machine would actually endorse their first black SGA candidate, Jared Hunter. However, Jared would do the unthinkable and publicly acknowledge that he was receiving support from the machine, which was a big no-no. Because as I've said, the machine is not registered. Generally, the election rules say that you're not allowed to just take money from whatever shadowy organization is offering you money. And of course, each election has a set campaign budget where they have to carefully account for where they're getting their money from and how they're spending it. But of course, if you're a machine candidate, it's likely those numbers are gonna be fudged a little bit. And so the election board actually sought to have Jared Hunter disqualified from running. This decision was appealed, overturned, and in response, the election board all collectively resigned because they felt powerless to sort of stop what was going on here. So Jared Hunter ultimately would be allowed to run and he would win the presidency, but he would ultimately step down in 2018 after being arrested for a DUI. All right, back to our sororities. In 2018, this video would surface. This is a video of an Alpha Phi member, Harley Barber, just spewing hate speech while her sorority sisters giggle in the background. Now, I did think about including this video and censoring the times that she says actual slurs, but it simultaneously like downplays what she's saying, but even so it's like still upsetting to watch. So the video is out there if you wanna look it up, but I'll just generally describe what she says. So there's the first video, which does not get talked about as much, where she like talks about children in Syria and water, I don't know, something weird. But then in the second video, she talks about how she's wanted to be an alpha feast since high school and no one understands, but someone took a screenshot of her Finsta because she was saying the N word. And she says, well, I'm in the South now, so I can say it as much as I want. N word, N word, N word. And again, sorority sisters laughing in the background. But so when this video surfaced, both Alabama Alpha Phi and the university would expel her from their organizations. And interestingly, a lot of free speech advocates would come to protest on her behalf because they alleged that this was a violation of her free speech. Although Harley Barber and her own mother said that they agreed with the expulsion. A former Alabama football player actually raised one of the most important points from all of this. Alpha Phi, be wary of the company you keep for they are a reflection of who you are or who you want to be. Harley Barber didn't wake up this morning and decide to spew racist rhetoric for the first time in her life. Therefore, I believe I speak on behalf of my brothers and myself when I say the Bama football team does not need the support cheers, or high fives of anyone who condones this type of intolerant, hateful behavior. I don't think that this kind of behavior is explicit to Alpha Phi or that everyone in Alpha Phi was complicit in this, but I do find it interesting that, again, in 2021, Alabama Alpha Phi would have a similar scandal where two women would have to be removed from the organization, including their then president, because text messages leaked of them saying racist stuff. Finally, wrapping up 2018, in 2018, the Greek Gods podcast would release, which details a lot of the history I've just told you about, uh, along with some interviews from former anti-machine candidates, former machine members, and current Alabama students. It's a great podcast. I definitely recommend you listen to it if you're interested in all of this. But this was, again, another signal that the secret organization of Alabama really couldn't stay secret anymore. Also in 2019, the Alabama football coach, Nick Saban, possibly alludes to the machine in a fall press conference. Uh, I can honestly say I was a little disappointed that there weren't more students at the last game. Um, so, and I think we're trying to address that. I don't know, maybe there's something else somebody ought to talk about. Maybe I shouldn't talk about it. Maybe I already talked about more than I should. But then again, uh, I've seen a few Alabama football games and Nick is infamously bad with the press. So maybe he was just in a silly, goofy mood when he said that. So of course, bit quiet for a little while while the world was on fire. 2020 wasn't much happening in the way of SGA and Greek life. But in 2021, we get Bama Rush. Except I lied, we're not talking about Bama Rush just yet because there is one more machine scandal we have to go over. So in 2021, the believed machine homecoming candidate was a woman named McLean Moore. Each homecoming candidate is required to give a weekly expenditure report and comply with an overall 
campaign budget to make sure that they're complying with the election rules. Failure to timely, accurately report at all can result in various levels of infractions. And if you have a certain number of infractions, the election board is supposed to disqualify you. So McLean Moore initially reported that she had spent zero dollars and received zero dollars, which is pretty odd because at that point she had hosted a car painting event, she had personalized signs and stickers, and she had high quality like HD resolution campaign video. So it just wasn't adding up. So she did later amend this and technically all of this qualified to disqualify her. Now it's important to point out that McLean was not the only homecoming candidate who messed up on these filings. Another candidate initially put $400 for her total expenditures, but of course, since this was over the budget, she also changed it to $350. But this was not the only controversy McLean would have. She would also be accused of, I guess tokenism is the word. So first of all, faceless graphics. If faceless graphics were a person, we would know where they were on January 6th. And if you've been in the trenches of Etsy, you know what I'm talking about. But faceless graphics aside, McLean had this campaign sign that featured her and a young black girl. This was supposed to represent her little sister in her little brother, little sister mentor program. And this received a bit of criticism because it kind of invokes white saviorism, seems exploitative. And honestly, I'm not sure if this little girl could really consent to being used in an adult's campaign. But the scandal does not stop there. So 2021's homecoming election would actually have a record turnout. And ordinarily the homecoming election results would be announced on Friday, the night of the bonfire. But the results were actually not announced until that following Monday. And so it would then be announced that McLean had received 47% of the total votes, and she had only received about 300 votes more than the runner-up candidate. Now, the election rules for homecoming pretty clearly state that to win the homecoming election, you have to receive at least 50% and one vote, but no candidate did that. So typically, when this happens, there is some sort of runoff election, at least generally speaking. But supposedly, because the homecoming rules did not specifically lay out a runoff procedure, the election committee just decided that they would not do a runoff and McLean would be the homecoming queen. And this is again, despite McLean having enough infractions to supposedly be disqualified. But enough with all that stuff, let's get into what y'all wanna talk about. Bama Rush, season one. It was across everyone's For You page, but a few notable fan favorites especially caught the attention of TikTok, and I don't think anyone really compares to Michaela, otherwise known as What Would Jimmy Buffett Do? I owe today for Rush Round 1, Philanthropy. So I'm wearing the pants store. There's the t-shirt that they gave us to wear today. And I'm wearing these white heels, but I'm probably gonna change into these. I just don't like the way these look. They look too dressy for this outfit, but I don't have a problem wearing heels. They're like, these are really comfortable and like broken in and stuff, so. I don't know. But despite Michaela winning the hearts of TikTok, she apparently would not win the hearts of PHA because she would not receive a bid from any sorority. And at the beginning of this video, I mentioned that Alabama recruitment has about a 92% success rate. So when you see a cute sociable girl like Michaela not getting a bid, you have to think that there's something that we don't know or that we're not seeing. And as someone who's been on both sides of recruitment at this point, I can say the most common reason why a girl is dropped is GPA. Each sorority is going to have independent GPA requirements. Ordinarily, if you don't meet the threshold requirement for that sorority, you're not supposed to be invited into later rounds with that sorority because it's just bad for everybody if you get like super attached to a group of girls and then you get rejected just because of your GPA at the end. But our Greek coordinator would mess this up quite frequently. And so I have to imagine when it's like thousands of people involved in this process, it gets messed up. But another sort of common reason why a girl might get dropped, if any sister has seen a PNM being publicly like really drunk, messy, racist, especially if there's a video of them. Because as we saw, if you display that publicly, like in 2018, it reflects bad on the chapter as a whole. So people don't really want to take on that kind of liability, even if they're okay with that kind of behavior privately. But also they may just not be okay with that behavior privately. But another at times unspoken reason, but it seems at times very spoken reason at the University of Alabama is a girl might get dropped because she can't assimilate to 
white Southern culture. Pretty much every way, Michaela does assimilate to that culture. But just a few days before she got dropped, she revealed that she was a biracial woman. Hey y'all, so it's day two of Sisterhood Round. I lost my voice and also I just want to clarify, I am mixed. So everyone trying to cancel me for going to tanning bed and being in the store because it's kind of dumb. And so when it was revealed that Michaela got dropped, rumors were flying. So there was a video released on Barstool. All things considered is not that scandalous. I'm not gonna show it because I feel like Michaela probably just doesn't want that being showed around publicly. But she's in like a bar bathroom with her friend and she's like, oh, my pants got ripped. And her friend says, I'm so drunk. And like, that's the video. She doesn't say that she's drunk. There's plenty of plausible deniability. It's not the worst thing. So that's one possible reason. Other people said that she maybe bullied people in high school, which one, I think she disputed but two, I just don't see how that would turn into her getting dropped from every single sorority. I doubt that those girls had ties to every single sorority on campus. That just doesn't seem logistically possible. But people did point out that her race may have also played a factor in Michaela getting dropped because even if we take into account the video as being the reason, it's pretty minor in the scale of like things that 18 year olds do. We'll never know the official reason why Michaela was dropped, but I can say that Michaela seems to be doing much better now. She seems much happier for not being in a sorority. And I believe she's actually transferred to Auburn University since this. So season two, Bama Rush. This year was kind of weird because at the beginning there was speculation that Bama Rush would not be able to happen because like I said, there's rumors flying around that HBO Max and Vice are miking up girls to go into this recruitment process. So supposedly sororities were being really strict about having your phones or even talking about recruitment, like even after you had your recruitment sessions. And actually one girl was sent home supposedly because her hair tie on the back of her shirt was mistaken for a wire. I just tuck it under and there you go. So I'm gonna have to give this one a zero out of 10. I did get kicked out of Alabama's recruitment process because they did think the hair tie was a wire, but it is really a cute style. But all that panic aside, a few people did still show their OOTDs and talk about going through the recruitment process. And again, a few fan favorites emerged. We of course had Kylan, who is not done justice by this board. Most people are not done justice by this board, let's be honest. Hey everyone, I hope you're having a great day. Not a good day, a great day. Today is day number five, Alabama Rush, and that means it's Sisterhood Day. I'm actually going to do an outfit of the day, but I just want to remind you that it's not all about your outfit. It's about your grades, your community service, your philanthropy, and there's so much more that goes into making a sorority. But my dress is actually from Giovanni by Henry Scott. It's at, like, I got it from Henry's Cloud Nine, but it's by Giovanni. And then my shoes are Shein, and my pearls were given to me by my mom at graduation. So I hope you have a great day, guys. Kylan, of course, went to Zeta Tau Alpha. Grayson went to Phi Mu. Lizzie went to Pi Beta Phi. Madison went Sigma Kappa, but ended up dropping the next day. And finally, another fan favorite was dropped this year, Grant Sykes. OOTD Bama Rush day one convocation and open houses today and this is what I'm wearing so the skirt is from Lulu it's the new pink edition my shoes are Air Force of course my shirt is from Shein it's the really really cute one that's like everything's gonna be okay and my jewelry is from all over the place um and yeah and my hair and makeup is done by yours truly so Wish me luck. Grand Sex gained over 100K describing her rush experience. You know, she's cute, she's charming, and she's non-binary. The fact that she was even allowed to rush was pretty scandalous. This was talked about on major news sites, but also on Greek rank, which is like a truly vile forum. Like the way people talk about sororities on that, on that website is crazy. But anyways, people speculated on Greek rank that even if Grant received a bid, whoever she received a bid from would automatically be marked as lower tier just by associating with her. And so there was again speculation that maybe her GPA was bad. Her GPA is 3.19, which is just below the recommended GPA for Rush, which is 3.2. So up in the air as to whether that played a factor. But also people speculated about whether she was a Trump supporter or had said some like problematic things. And she said that her personal politics are none of anyone's business, which one answers the question, I think, but two, I really don't know if her being conservative or having problematic views. I mean, unless they were like really out there would impact her ability to rush at Alabama because this is still a, a conservative state, guys. Like I don't think if she's a Republican, that's not really gonna impact her. But also, I mean, the tough thing is even if a sorority was super open-minded and really connected with Grant and wanted to include her, 
I think a lot of sororities have this fear that if they accept someone who's more diverse, more conservative sororities and fraternities will ban them from their events. I mean, that was the justification that kept racial segregation going as long as it did. And this is why public accountability is so crucial. And this becomes especially true when we realize that entry life to Greek life is entry life to the machine, which is becoming entry life to politics generally. Because getting into a sorority, getting a seat on the SGA, yeah, it can seem frivolous, but it still has impacts after these people graduate. I mean, for example, we have Katie Britt. Katie Britt is the current Republican candidate for the US Senate seat in Alabama and is overwhelmingly expected to win that seat. Katie ran for SGA president in 2003 and won. I mentioned earlier that was also the year that Alabama first introduced internet voting and the election had to be overturned because there was evidence of voter fraud. So the Crimson White received an email believed to have originally come from a sorority sister's computer machine computer that had 170 student ID numbers and social security numbers, which could be used to access the internet voting. And I'm not saying that Katie herself was involved in any of this scandal, we don't know, but Katie did receive 90% of the vote in that initial election, which had to be invalidated. And they later did a paper ballot and she again, overwhelmingly won that second election. And I have no reason to doubt the validity of those results. But I do find it interesting that since she is now a Trump-backed candidate, she has said that fraud played a role in Trump losing the 2020 election, although she apparently did not go as far to say that the election was stolen. And I just can't help but wonder how coming from a group like this, with a history like this, how that doesn't impact your worldview, or at least your view of politics. I mean, when you're a teenager, when you're in your 20s, that is not the time to be super cynical about politics and think that the only way to win an election is through lying and cheating and doing whatever's necessary to get a seat. And so if there is a little group at the University of Alabama who happens to call themselves the machine or Theta Nu Epsilon, register with your university and seriously reflect on how you as an organization today meaningfully differs from the organization in the previous century, other than, you know, not cross burning and not assaulting people. It doesn't seem like that's happening anymore, but that's not the only markers of whether you're like a good or a bad group. Because ultimately, do we want people who exclusively wear outfits like this every day to be running all of campus life? I don't. Certainly not in federal government positions either. Or maybe I made this all up and this is an elaborate joke and please don't sue me. Anyways, I hope y'all found this as interesting as I did. I know that this is not what I normally talk about on my channel, but another plot twist, my sister went to the University of Alabama, graduated recently. So I find this all just like super fascinating. And if you liked this video, feel free to like, and if you liked me, maybe subscribe and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye.